Old Testament reading, the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37. Ezekiel, chapter 37. Many of you will know the Negro spiritual based on this chapter. Dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones. The power of the Lord was upon me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley full of old, dry bones that were scattered everywhere across the ground. He led me around among them, and then he said to me, Son of dust, can these bones become people again? I replied, Lord, you alone know the answer to that. Then he told me to speak to the bones and say, O oh, dry bones, listen to the words of God. For the Lord God says, See, I am going to make you live and breathe again. Can you imagine this scene? A preacher looking at a lot of skeletons and prepared to preach. That gives some of us great encouragement. <laughs> Fancy saying to bones, talking to bones, dead bones, and preaching to them, and believing that the word of God can do something in that situation. What faith this man Ezekiel had. I'm going to make you live and breathe again. I will replace the flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you shall live and know I am the Lord. So I spoke these words from God just as he told me to. And suddenly there was a rattling noise all across the valley and the bones of each body came together and attached to each other as they used to be. Then as I watched the muscles and flesh formed over the bones and skin covered them, but the bodies had no breath. Then he told me to call to the wind and say, The Lord God says, Come from the four winds, O Spirit, and breathe upon these slain bodies that they may live again. So I spoke to the winds as he commanded me and the bodies began breathing. They lived and stood up a very great army. You could say that God gave them all the kiss of life and that the breath of God, the wind just filled their lungs, caused them to start moving again. Then he told me what the vision meant. These bones, he said, represent all the people of Israel. They say we have become a heap of dried out bones. All hope is gone. But tell them, the Lord God says, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again and return to the land of Israel. And then at last, O oh, my people, you will know I am the Lord. I will put my spirit into you and you shall live and return home again to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have done just what I promised you. We had a pretty heavy service this morning. I did too, so we're going to have a rather more brief service this evening and I just want to introduce you in the, to the first of two talks on what we believe about the Holy Spirit. 1974, I begin my 25th year as a minister. I was preaching some two and a half to three years before that. And looking back over that period of preaching the gospel, there have been many changes in church life. I would say the majority of them for the better. Some, not so good. But I would say that the biggest change of all, which makes me more optimistic and more excited today than I've ever been in my ministry before, more expectant that God is doing something, the biggest change that I've noticed is this. The change from believing in two persons of the Godhead to believing in three. 
Now I know that the church has always said it believed in three. We've talked of the Trinity. We've always mentioned Father, Son, and Holy Ghost at the end of the service. Even our symbols have done this. If you've ever seen three circles overlapping like that, carved in the end of a pew, that's a symbol of the Trinity of three and one. But there is the world of difference between believing that and believing in. And I have the feeling that in those days when I began to preach and when I became a minister, that far too many of us believed that there was a Holy Spirit but did not believe in the Holy Spirit. And someone has, I think, fairly accurately summed up the situation by saying that Catholics were more conscious of Father, Son, and Holy Virgin, and Protestants were more conscious of Father, Son, and Holy, Sp Holy Scripture. And the Holy Spirit was rightly described in those days as the displaced person of the Trinity. You never heard him mentioned. You didn't hear people in the pews talk about him. You didn't hear one person say to another, do you know what the Holy Spirit's been doing for me this week? And once a year on Whit Sunday, I, like most preachers, tried very hard to produce a sermon on the Holy Spirit and did so, with the uneasy feeling that I would leave him alone in my preaching till the following Whit Sunday, that that was the annual recognition that there was such a person. Am I exaggerating? Funnily enough, the situation now is almost the reverse. But looking back on those days long ago, for many of us in the Christian church, our relationship with the third person of the Godhead was unconscious rather than conscious, was indirect rather than direct, was doctrinal rather than dynamic, was an inference rather than a direct intuition. Now that's all changed. And wherever I go, I just hear the Holy Spirit being talked about. Funnily enough, what many people feared would happen has not happened. Many people said if we switch to talking about the Holy Spirit, you'll find people will no longer talk about Jesus. But in fact, what has happened is that people are talking about Jesus more than they ever did. For when the Holy Spirit is active, Jesus said he will glorify me. And one of the effects of a more personal, a more direct, a more conscious, a more dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit is that more people are talking about Jesus. And his name is spreading more than it's ever spread right through the world. It's even on the mass media frequently. Now, it is necessary today to have teaching on the Holy Spirit for as I travel around and talk to churches and ministers, I find that we are rapidly developing two groups of people. And neither seems to want teaching on the Holy Spirit. First of all, there is one group that is scared, stiff, suspicious, defensive. Don't want to hear the preacher talk about the Holy Spirit ever again. One minister told me just last week, he said, in our church, I've got the funny feeling that if I mention the Holy Spirit, that the congregation's pulling in, just doesn't want to hear anymore. On the other hand, are those who are no longer frightened of the Holy Spirit, who've discovered by personal experience that there's nothing to be afraid of with a Holy Spirit, nothing at all. And he's a, a loving gentleman. And they are living in experiences of the Spirit. And they too are tending to have their reaction, don't give me teaching about the Holy Spirit, I just want experiences of him. And that can so easily lead to fanaticism and unbalanced teaching. And so both these groups need to unite by coming together again, by looking together at the teaching the Word of God gives us about the Holy Spirit. Every experience we have or do not have, everything we are seeking or running away from, must be tested in the last analysis by the teaching of the Word of God on the Holy Spirit. And therefore I'm going to spend tonight talking about what I might call the objective aspect of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to speak about the Holy Spirit 
perhaps in a rather impersonal way. And then next Sunday night, I'm going to get down to the personal, the Holy Spirit in the individual's experience and life. But tonight we'll take an objective look, we'll stand back as it were, and look at who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. Again, I've told you before that these are refresher courses. I'm going to say things that I've said before, but may God bring them home to you in a fresh way. We can begin with this basic phrase, the Holy Spirit. And every one of those three words presents us with a disturbing challenge as to whether we really want the Holy Spirit, as to whether we really want the Holy Spirit, as to whether we are ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And I want to draw out the meaning of those three words as a personal challenge. You remember the little girl who when the vicar marched in in all his white robes, said, Is that the Holy Ghost, mummy? <laughs> there were two points out of three in which she was absolutely right. Number one, she expected to see a person when she talked about the Holy Ghost. Absolutely right. Number two, she expected to see that person in church. And she was right. Number three, she thought it was the vicar and she was wrong. <laughs> well, she was right two out of three. Are you right as much as that little girl? Do you think of the Holy Spirit as a person or something impersonal, some floating force, some vague atmosphere? Or do you say, he, he, he? Do you expect the Holy Spirit to be in church when you go so that you could see or hear something which your heart said, is that the Holy Ghost? Well, that's how the little girl came to church and that's how we've come here tonight. How do we know he's a person? Most of the cults I meet today talk about the Holy Spirit as a force. It's one of the marks of a false cult that they do not believe the Holy Spirit is a person. Therefore, they usually deny the Trinity straight away. But they do not feel that he's a person. How do I know that he's a person? Well, I just read my Bible and I find that everything he does is, is something that only a person can do. He talks, he teaches, he searches, he cries out, he guides, he leads. I never knew of a force that could do that. I only thought people can do that kind of thing. I find that I can do things to him that can only be done to a person. I can cause him sadness. I can grieve him. I can rebel against him. I can disobey him. I can't do that to a force. I can only do it to a person. But the supreme proof that the Holy Spirit is to be thought of as a person with a heart that feels, with a mind that thinks, with a will that acts, a person, a personality, the thing that clinches it for me is the way Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit on the night before he died. And in lovely words, he said, I've got to go back home. I'm going home. And you may feel orphaned. That's the word he used. You may feel orphaned. You may feel I've let you down. I've left you alone. But don't worry. Don't worry. I'm sending someone else just like me to take my place. And he'll be better for you than I've been. You'll be better off with him than you have been with me. That is an extraordinary thing to say. You'll be better off. And he spoke of another comforter. And the word another is a Greek word that means just like me. They had two words in the ancient language for another, one of which meant something quite different or someone quite different, and one of which meant something or someone just the same. And the word Jesus used was just the same. Another comforter, just the same as I am. I'm sorry that word comforter ever got into the Bible, into our English translation. It's so misleading. It has led the church of Jesus Christ into the deadly attitude that they come to church to be made comfortable. And that word comfortable has nothing to do with the teaching of the Bible about the comforter. 
It is, alas, our deep desire humanly in the flesh that we should be comfortable. But the Holy Spirit never made me comfortable. It's one of the reasons we don't welcome him all that much, because he makes you uncomfortable. The word comfort has included in it four letters, which are the heart of the word, fought. From the Latin fortis, courageous, brave, courage. Same as the word fortress, and it means that when the Holy Spirit comes, he wants to turn people into fortresses. That implies attack, that implies battle, not comfortable. But to be a fortress in a world in which you're going to be attacked, to be strong and brave when you're going through it. I've seen this done. I've seen the Holy Spirit take weak cowards by nature, and I've seen them, him turn them into a fortress and they've come through situations and people have said, how did they come through that? And it's because the Holy Spirit has done his work of true comforting. Well, now here's the first thing I want to say. It's in the little word, the. We never talk about a Holy Spirit. That would imply a force, an impersonal thing. And if you go away saying, you know, there was a nice spirit in the meeting, a good spirit in the service... You've used the wrong language. Use the word the. That's personal. The spirit was in the meeting. The spirit was in the service. And you've said something personal. Now here's the first challenge I want to bring you. If the Holy Spirit were just a power and not a person, we could manipulate him. But you can't manipulate a person. For example, we have electricity piped into our house and we are in charge of it we're in a house that has power laid on and we can switch it on we can switch it off we can do this that and the other with it but the electricity in our house never tells us what to do we've got it taped and tapped but the electricity can't tell us what to do it can't mold our lives well it might do in the next few days but only negatively, <laughs> not positively. We'll just turn away from it and buy a candle or something. But you see, the Holy Spirit's not like that. And I've counseled people and talked to people and gained the distinct impression that they are seeking the Holy Spirit because they just want power turned on, which they can manipulate, power for their life. They are asking for the Holy Spirit in their life. They do not intend their life to change. They want the Holy Spirit. They want this power that people talk about. They want the joy that comes through being filled with the Spirit. But they want this Spirit tapped in their life. They want to be turned on, but they want to be able to turn off. And you know, the Holy Spirit's a person. Now, from time to time, we have opened our home to people and had them come and live with us and stay with us. And that's a totally different situation, isn't it? For now you have a person there all the time. And now your relationships are changing. Now your family life is changing. Now you are no longer totally in charge of what is happening. Now there are other personal desires. Now there's a person in your home who may have different moods and may want to do different things. And it's affecting you. And it's changing you. And you can't just switch off. You can't put them in a cupboard. You can't just do that. And you're no longer having dealings with the person. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you can't just keep things as they were. And you can't put the Holy Spirit in a cupboard when you want to just be yourself. He's there. He's there for good. And the personal spirit is going to affect your life very deeply because he has desires. He has things he wants to do. I was asked a fortnight ago to go and speak to representatives from 35 Baptist churches who'd met for a weekend conference, and they gave me this subject. They said, will you speak on the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer? And when I got there, I took a preacher's liberty, and I said, the first thing I want to do is to change the subject. You've got it wrong way round. I'm using the same words, but I will speak to you on the believer in the life of the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that a difference? totally different. The Bible doesn't so much talk about the Holy Spirit living in your life. It talks about what happens when you are living in his. 
and his life will be very different from yours. For the wind blows where it lists and you never know where it's going to blow next and you just don't know what's going to happen to your life once you're living in his life. This is the first challenge I put to you. The Holy Spirit is personal. Therefore, you can't have him just like that to switch on and off when you want him. And to be in your life a power that's manipulated by you and able to be put in the cupboard when you want, you are asking a person who will come and expect you to live in his life and to go where he desires to go, and that's a very different thing. Now, the second challenge which comes from this phrase, the Holy Spirit. There are many spirits abroad, and I'm afraid there is only one that is holy. There are intoxicating spirits abroad, and thousands of people will be blind drunk tonight. And the Bible says there is a similarity between the Holy Spirit's coming and getting drunk with alcohol. Some of us, of course, in church have never been drunk with alcohol. We don't even know what that is. It sometimes perhaps makes it more difficult to imagine being filled with the Spirit. But John Wesley said, give me a hundred God-intoxicated men and I'll turn England upside down. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, people said they're drunk. Wonder how often people have looked at us coming out of church and said they must have been at the bottle in there. Never. And Paul said, don't be filled with wine. Don't get drunk with wine. That's wasteful. That's debauchery. You'll have nothing but a hangover. But be filled with the Spirit and sing and make melody. Have you ever thought of going down that drive from here out after a service, singing together while they come out of the Britannia next door singing something else? Have you ever thought about it? <laughs> but the intoxicating spirit is not holy. And many people have done unholy things because they've drunk something that reduced their inhibitions. Then there are also hysterical spirits which you can easily spot. They are worked up. They are uncontrolled. There was an old newsreel film of one of Adolf Hitler's speeches in Munich before the war just a few nights ago. And the thing that struck me is this. There were in front of the platform young girls behaving in exactly the same way, exactly the same way as they've behaved in front of pop stars today. It was a hysterical spirit, uncontrolled, weeping, and shouting, and this can happen. But that's a hysterical spirit. It's not holy. It doesn't lead people to be better people. It doesn't make them do holy things. It makes them do silly things like crowd an airport as if four teenagers from the States were God. And then there are also spirits of mania. It's possible to have religious mania. People do. It's distressing when it happens. But it's not Holy Spirit that does that. Because Holy Spirit is healthy. The word holy and healthy are the same word. They mean whole. And when the Holy Spirit is busy, wholeness is what he produces. He doesn't produce disease, physical or mental. And then there are demonic spirits who are possessing more and more people today because they dabble in things they don't understand. And they never produce holiness. God's breath is clean. God's Spirit is holy, and here is the second challenge. Oh, I want power in my life. I want joy in my life. I want peace. But the Holy Spirit says, do you want a Holy Spirit? Because that's what I am. Do you really want me to blow clean? Do you really want me to come in? I'm Holy Spirit. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? I know you hunger and thirst after friendship. I know you hunger and thirst after excitement. I know you hunger and thirst after this, that and the other, but do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? If not, I'm not the person you're looking for. And the third challenge I've got for you tonight is this. The personal, holy, pure, spirit, powerful. Do you know that every single metaphor, every single picture of the Holy Spirit in the Bible is of something on the move? Do you know that sometimes the Holy Spirit is pictured as flames 
Flames, and if you've watched flames burning fire, they are never still, never static. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is sometimes likened to a bubbling spring, welling up, and a bubbling spring is never static. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is sometimes likened to flowing oil? Have you ever tried to stop a river of flowing oil? So slippery you can't get hold of it. It goes on everywhere. And above all, do you know that the Holy Spirit is likened to a howling gale? The wind of the Spirit, the breath of the Spirit. You can't have wind unless air is on the move. And one night after dark, Jesus told Nicodemus, listen, sitting on this housetop, you can feel the wind. You know that it's hit you. You don't know where it's come from and you don't know where it's going. I tell you this, when the Holy Spirit comes, you're on the move. He is power that shifts. That's why he doesn't make you comfortable. When you're not comfortable, you move, don't you? We spend a long time with these pews. And we had mock-ups and models, and now you're sitting on the best pew we can design. Are you sitting comfortably? I think you are because you don't shuffle, you don't keep crossing your legs, but if you're uncomfortable, you'll be on the move. And the Holy Spirit's power gets God's people on the move. The one thing God doesn't like is God's people getting stuck at one point and not getting on and not moving. And I don't know where he's going to move us to. I just never know where the Holy Spirit's going to blow next. It's just one constant discovery of surprises. Power. Invisible, invincible power. Because there's not one of us in this room can control the wind. There is no human being who can control the wind. It's on the move. Nor is there any meteorologist alive who can tell me what direction the wind is going to be blowing in next Sunday. And in the same way, there isn't a Christian on earth can tell you where the wind's going to blow next of God's Spirit. The word wind and the word breath and the word spirit in the Bible are the same word. When God blows, it's the sound of a gale. It's interesting that the Hebrew language had two words for wind or breath. One was a word that meant a soft breeze, gentle breeze. The other was the word for a howling gale. And you know, never in the scripture is the word for a gentle breeze used of God's Holy Spirit. Did you know that? The very Hebrew word, R-U-A-C-H, pronounced ruach. Did you hear the wind? It's an onomatopoeic word. It, it, it conveys the meaning in the sound of the word of what it is. I lived up in the Shetland Islands, as you know, 24 years ago, and there we knew what wind was. My, they even laid the gravestones flat in the cemeteries. It saved time putting them up again. They did. And the little crofts, they had a porch outside the front door, to give a double door to stop the wind getting in and blowing the roof off. And the roofs had wires over with stones hanging on the end of the wires to hold the roof down. Boy, you don't know what wind is unless you've been up there. I've seen the wind gauge at the meteorological station at Lowick against 120 mark. Couldn't go further. My next door neighbor went down to the beach to pull his boat higher up in a gale to make it safe and neither he nor the boat was seen again. I saw my dustbin cross the road without touching the road. And you know what gales are up there. And that's what God's Spirit is. Do you want that? Or do you prefer to sing, and his that gentle voice we hear, soft as the breath of even? Is that what you want to sing? You'll find it in the hymn book, but not in the Bible. In the Bible, you find they were all together in one place and suddenly there came the sound of a rushing, mighty wind. And boy, did it blow them. It blew them out into the streets of Jerusalem and out to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's still blowing. Now, you see, the question is, do we want the Spirit? Do we want the Holy Spirit? Do we want the Holy Spirit? then that's the question we've got to ask and answer before we dabble in these things. Let me turn briefly to what he does. What he does. The Holy Spirit is the executor of the Godhead. Now, I've been an executor for one or two people for their wills. 
and they have to die to make possible my work. And then when they die, the inheritance becomes available to someone else and it's my job as executor to see that someone else gets what they have died to make possible. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. Jesus died to make everything possible and it's the Holy Spirit's job now to bring what has been made available to those of you who should inherit it. When Jesus died, he made a will. He hadn't much to leave. He couldn't leave his clothes. They were taken from him. He had no house and nowhere to lay his head, so he had no property to leave. But he said, I leave you my peace. But whose job is it to see that we get it? The fruit of the Spirit is peace. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to do what Jesus makes possible. In fact, whatever the Father wills and whatever the Son makes possible, the Holy Spirit is the practical person of the Godhead who gets on and does it. When God said at the beginning of creation, let there be light, the Father planned it and ordered it. The Son was certainly involved in it because without him was nothing made that has been made. But who actually did it? The Holy Spirit brooded on the chaos. And it was the Holy Spirit who created this world of ours. I could even say this, it was the Holy Spirit who hatched it out. Because the word used brooding means a broody hen sitting on eggs. And the Holy Spirit hatched out what God ordered. And it is still his way, as in creation, so in the new creation. The recreation of a single person is all the work of the Holy Spirit, brooding, hatching out what God has planned. Is that putting it in simple English for you? It's using Bible terms, but I think perhaps it'll make it real for you. Therefore, I can say that wherever the Spirit is active, there is a tremendous creativity about him. All kinds of new things will happen. New songs will be composed. New adventures in service will take place. And it is this very creativity which we need so much in the church. This sense of throwing our nets on the other side, of doing something different, doing something new. Alas, our human security loves things the same way as they've always been. We love to have services like our grandparents had and sing the hymns that they sang in the Victorian era, but where the Holy Spirit is, there is creativity. New things are coming to birth. It's a mark that he's present. A second work of the Holy Spirit was to bring into being the nation of Israel. God willed it. Christ made it possible, but it was the Holy Spirit who did it. And he did it by taking ordinary men and women and making them extraordinary by giving them gifts they never had before. It does not matter what great man or woman you name from the Old Testament, you will find that it says about them that the Spirit of the Lord was responsible for what they did or what they said or what they were. Have you ever noticed that? I've sometimes asked children in the Sunday school, who was the strongest man in the Bible? Please, Sir Samson. And I've said, I'm afraid you're wrong. He was very, very weak. He couldn't lift a little finger against the Philistines by himself. Who was the wisest man in the Bible? Please, Sir Solomon. A man who has 3,000 wives and concubines can hardly merit the title of the wisest man. <laughs> One is ideal. <laughs> but that was a triumph of hope over experience, if ever there was one. Samson, Solomon himself, was a fool. He wasn't wise. The spirit of wisdom was given to him. As the spirit of the Lord came on Samson when he carried city gates 20 miles. And you trace through and the people of the Bible were not wonderful people. They were not extraordinary people. They were very ordinary people with few gifts, if any. But when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit was the executor of the Godhead and enabled these ordinary people to build a nation against all possible odds and lead them through crisis after crisis. Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Elijah, you study all their lives and you'll find it says somewhere in the account the Spirit of the Lord came on them. Take a third thing the Spirit has done. He's given us the Bible. 
I've slipped mine underneath. Here it is, the Bible. Do you realize that we wouldn't have this book if the Holy Spirit was not the executor of the Godhead? Here is a book that was compiled over a period of 1,400 years by 40 different authors in three different languages, and not one of them knew they were writing this book. Not one. And yet when you read it, it hangs together perfectly. It's about one theme. It's a consistent book. It's still the most relevant book for your problems you'll read. How on earth did these men manage to write it? The answer is they didn't. The Holy Spirit took over their minds and their mouths and their pens and he wrote it. And that's the Bible's claim for itself. So that you'll find that when Jesus talks about the Bible, sometimes he says, the scripture says, and sometimes he says, the Holy Spirit says. But it's the same thing to him. That's how you got the Bible. That's part of the Holy Spirit's work. And I will tell you this, unless you have the Holy Spirit teaching you while you read it, you won't make any sense of it. He wrote it and you'll need him to understand it. And then what about Jesus Christ? I hope you won't misunderstand this, but Jesus could not have been the Christ without the Holy Spirit. Jesus was always there. He was the eternal Son of God. But how on earth did the eternal Son of God become a little human baby here on earth? How did he do it? The answer is he didn't. The Holy Spirit did it. And an angel came to a 15-year-old girl in a little village in the Middle East and said, you're going to have a baby son, though you've never known a man. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. And you can do this thing when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ever since Christians reciting the creed have said, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And all the way through the ministry of Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit who enabled him to do what he did. Why did he not preach a single sermon before he was 30 years of age? Why did he not perform a single miracle before he was 30 years of age? I'll tell you why. He couldn't. And until you've realized this, you've missed a very important truth. He became so human that in fact he couldn't do these things without the power of the Holy Ghost. So he was baptized in the Jordan, and as he stood praying after his own baptism, the Holy Spirit was poured out on him and came down in the form of a dove, once again a dove, fluttering on the move. And from then on he preached, and his first sermon was on the text, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor to do other things too, open the eyes of the blind, set captives free. And then when he performed his miracles, do you know what he said? He said, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, Jesus did not attribute his miracles to himself. He, he attributed them to the third person of the Trinity. So even Christ, everything he did, how did he go through the cross? How did he survive? We are told that through the eternal spirit he offered himself up as a sacrifice for us. How did he get out of that tomb? Do you think he pushed the stone away? Do you think he got out? No. The spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body, says Paul, saying that it was the spirit who did it. God willed it. The spirit did it. And then think of the church. The church is the product of the Holy Spirit. I can't build a church. You can't build a church. No one can build the church. For you see, Jesus, the head of the church, is now in heaven. And his body is on earth. He therefore needs a representative on earth to convey orders from the head to the body. He needs a substitute. He needs, to use a very old word, he needs a vicar on earth. The word vicar means a representative of someone else, someone who vicariously, on someone else's behalf, acts. And I will tell you who the vicar is. The vicar is the Holy Spirit. Let it be known to all and sundry that the head of this church here at Millmead is Jesus Christ. And let it be known that the vicar is the Holy Spirit. That's how a head and body act together. What was it changed those frightened apostles into men of such courage? People say, well, it was the resurrection. Nothing of the kind. 
The changed apostles are no proof of the resurrection because my Bible tells me that even a whole week after the resurrection, they're still in an upper room with barred doors and the furniture up against the doors. Don't tell me the resurrection made them bold. Made them glad, but it didn't make them bold. What was it made them bold? Why, it was when the Holy Spirit came down. And from then on, they spoke the word of God with boldness. So the church of Jesus Christ is also the work of the Holy Spirit. Our worship, our ministry, our evangelism, we cannot do a single thing of any lasting value without the Holy Spirit. Oh, I know you can run a religious club. You can get a group of faithful people together. You can keep yourselves going financially with bazaars. You can do all this without the Holy Spirit. But you'll not build the church one little bit. And when in the light of eternity your work is tested, if you've done it without the Holy Spirit, there'll be nothing left. The Holy Spirit works in the church. And so I'm going to finish tonight by saying that, alas, this is not always true. The most challenging sentence I've read in the last three months is this. It's a sentence by Dr. Carl Bates in an American book, and this is what he says. If God were to take the Holy Spirit out of our midst today, about 95% of what we are doing in our churches would go on. And we would not know the difference. That's a terrible indictment if it's true. But let's ask ourselves seriously, what could go on? Would the services go on? Would the Sunday school go on? Could the choir practice be held next Friday? Could the men's contact club hold its next meeting and have an interesting lecture? Could the women's meeting go on? Could we continue the activities of the church without the Holy Spirit? That's the question. Dr. Carl Bates went on to say, but when you study the church of the New Testament, if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from them, 95% of what they did would be stopped. I want to leave that challenge with you tonight. Because of this, for this reason, a church cannot be full of the Holy Spirit unless its individual members want to be. For the church is made up of individual people and men and women before God. So we finish where we began. Do you want the person to come, in which case we'll have to adjust to this new person We'll have to take into account his wishes and his desires. We can't put him in the cupboard. Do you want the Holy Spirit? He's going to change our character, our behavior. Do you want the Holy Spirit, the power that you can't control, this invincible, invisible power like the gale that blows? Well, if you do, then he wants to come. And when he comes, the church is delivered from sameness and from tradition and from deadness and from sinfulness. The most moving story or illustration that I've ever come across about the Holy Spirit is of a ship that was wrecked in the South Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Brazil. And the crew took to the lifeboats in the storm, and they managed to ride out the storm in one lifeboat. And there they floated in the South Atlantic for days and weeks. They had plenty of food, but they lacked fresh water, so they could not masticate the food they had. And they got gradually weaker and weaker. Till finally one of them noticed a little plume of smoke on the horizon, and they tore off their ragged shirts and they waved and they waved and they shouted and the ship, sh ship saw them and came. And when the big ship drew near and the sailors of the ship crowded the decks and looked down at the little lifeboat, one of the sailors on the deck said, Why didn't you dip your bucket over the side? And they looked back as if this was a cruel jest at a time like this. But one of the sailors did just that and he lifted his bucket and he dipped it over the side and he drank and it was fresh water. They had been floating off the mighty Amazon River 
which pushes fresh water 150 miles out into the Atlantic. And there they were, surrounded by fresh water. And they could have been drinking it. I believe that the Holy Spirit given to the Church of Christ in the days of the Apostles is still there. God has not withdrawn. And God says to his dead, stale church, Why didn't you dip your bucket? Why didn't you drink of my spirit? Why were you so scared? Why didn't you drink a deep draft? Why didn't you allow my breath to blow? Why didn't you allow my flames to burn? Why didn't you allow my oil to flow? Why didn't you let me move? And of course there is no answer to that. Except that we are perhaps for our sin and self-centeredness too afraid of God. Let us pray. O oh God, your Holy Spirit is present, blowing through hearts tonight, blowing away doubts and fears and desires for sin, and just blowing fresh and clean. We praise you that you didn't just tell us what to do. You wanted to give us the power to do it. You don't just hold out an ideal, you offer us the help. And, O oh God, in your mercy, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is available. And we pray that as a fellowship we may grow in the knowledge of your power. Be willing to be moved wherever you want to move us. And, O oh Lord, do it for your glory and your glory alone. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There's a hymn on the bulletin, if somebody could just bring me a bulletin. Oh, breath of God, breathe on us now and move within us. Sorry, I'm quoting from memory and I've quoted wrongly. Oh, breath of life, come sweeping through us. Hymn number two on the bulletin is our closing hymn. Thank you. Thank you.